All right, up next we have Katie Tesdale talking about thermal insulation for a Mars inflatable greenhouse. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Ken Teasdale, and I'll be talking to you about this topic of thermal insulation, uh, what I refer to as hyperinsulation for the Mars surface greenhouse. So uh, one day, a couple years ago, I was scout surfing on direct TV, and I came across the second episode of the NGC series about Mars. It's pretty amazing to me. I recorded the series. And long about December, uh, they had the fifth episode of it. And things had gone sideways, and uh, colonists on Mars were freezing their butts, and plants were dying because of a power failure. And as that was happening, a little light went off in my head because I've been developing a uh, hyper insulation panel, an advanced thermal insulation panel that will fit on buildings. You kind of think of it as taking a uh, you kind of take a thermos bottle and you put it down over a two or three story uh, I mean building and you achieve something like 80 percent reduction in the heat, uh, heat usage for the building. And it was working pretty well technically. Um, the only problem that the what you would otherwise do would be these vacuum insulated panels that have been in the uh, off the shelf for about 20 years. Um, they wouldn't do quite as good a job, but they're two to three times cheaper. So without that economic incentive, I kind of put it on the back burner. But in looking at the uh, uh, Mars <coughs> special, uh, I wondered to myself what how the panels would work on Mars in the environment. Just some peculiarities about it. So I went off and dusted off my Excel spreadsheet model for it, started plugging in data from Mars environment, and started redesigning it a little bit. And I was kind of blown away by the results of that. Um, so the panels are intended to be about 80% better than what you get off the shelf. Pretty good improvement. They were too expensive. But when you put them in a Mars environment, you get a factor of 30 improvement in the insulation. On top of that, you cut the cost by a factor of 10, and you would cut the weight factor by a factor of 10. So I thought that was a good combination to take to Mars. So I started looking at stuff on the internet, and I came across uh, paper by Inka Hublitz. In 2005, it was her graduate paper that she worked with NASA on. And it was a wonderful compendium of a lot of engineering things that we've done over 20 years or so. And about two thirds of the way through it, I've got to uh, her optimization for an inflatable greenhouse. Now, this is my idea here. I can't get so, um, Here's the double wall inflatable part of it, and you blow that up, and then after that's inflated, you fill the inside. I was using 0.6 atmospheres of pressure. She used 0.3 because it's cheaper. But at 0.6 atmospheres, the individual working in there, the colonist, could walk around in shirts, short sleeve shirt, shorts, and flip flops, and do the farming rather than have a full pressure suit. So. Being a vineyard owner, it made sense to me. Uh, so it's um, this one greenhouse, it's a little bit bigger than hers, would supply 55% of the calories for one individual. So, uh, but the problem is that uh, in Martian night, it gets cold. So here's a heat loss for an uninsulated. Uh, greenhouse in green. You're talking 40 to 50 kilowatts per greenhouse per individual. That's a lot of power to be stepping up. And I think somebody from Aerospace Corporation who was working with us said, well, let's just throw a MLI blanket on top of the greenhouse at night, take it off in the morning. Good, good idea, but 
greenhouse is 200 square meters, and that's a big blanket. And uh, what it does, it buys you this heat benefit here uh, in the nighttime. Here's uh, noon, midnight, midnight time scale. And as you uh, take it off, you're still hitting 32, 35 kilowatts of power being lost that you have to supply as uh, heat from your power supplies. So that didn't sound like a good idea to me. I mean, 35 kilowatts, that's like four 10 kilowatt kilo uh, power reactors per greenhouse per person. And that seems like a lot. And if you multiply it by four, say you had four columnists, you have to. So I was trying to think of what we could do about it. My kennels are made out of entirely out of metal. But they're the best insulator in the universe. So uh, in a greenhouse that doesn't work out. So I came up with an idea for uh, uh, an exoskeleton that would sit on top of the greenhouse. So the exoskeleton is this orange uh, tubular structure that it's one meter long pieces that all snap together like a tent. Uh, you put that up before you inflate your greenhouse. So you create that. These little guys down here are uh, rotating hinges for the panels. The panels go on. And what you have to do is you have to bring the materials, titanium alloy, with you to Mars and assemble them out. We'd have automated equipment for laser welding, vacuum equipment, and things like that. So each one of these long movers here, 18 meters long, is a one by three panel times six. And you attach them to the uh, pivot points to the hinges. And the way you move them around is like this. So here's a cross section. Here's the panels coming down. Here's one that's been open. You'll have the hinge point here, which rotates about the outer perimeter. So they're always in contact with each other. And you have wire guide wires that come up and down on the outside edges. So the wire coming up, which is how you pull the panel up, is supported by a wire across the greenhouse, supported by a couple poles, and you have multiple poles there. So you have to do a little bit of work that way. And you have a guide wire coming in, and these are all driven by um, stepper movers that are controlled by a computer. So um, you pull these back into place. And that's how the thing, there's some attachable, long, elongated, uh, inflated little boy things that attach to the greenhouse so the panel, when it comes in place, is uh, making firm contact and keep it heat in. Now, when you open up one of these things, uh, you've got 11 louvers going around and one open. When you have infrared heat inside, it's bouncing around and being absorbed and kicked back. But out here, you're losing one twelfth of it. So you can let heat out this way when you open it up. Okay, so what I did is made a little cartoon here. It shows what happens on a greenhouse over a 12-hour period on Mars. So these louvers over here are opened up. This is the east. They're pointing at the sun. You want to minimize the shadow being cast. Uh, it's every 15 minutes. They're not moving this fast. It's just their position every 15 minutes. Here's noon time. Uh, panels over here are facing in opposite directions. And this one over here. Okay. You're doing both letting light in, but you also are building up heat. And you got to let the heat out. So you're opening the panels and balancing off that factor. So, uh, and this is also what you would do in direct sunlight. So it's getting late in the day, and there's end of day and start. And when you do that, this is what you get. Here's a graph from before, uninsulated MOI, and this is the heat flow in and out with the panels. Activating. So you're opening panels, you build up the heat, you open up another panel. That's plus or minus two and a half kilowatts. With the thermal mass you have inside the greenhouse, that'll average out so you don't need to add any heat, you don't need to take any air conditioning. 
But the important thing is this. Out here in the nighttime, it looks like it's zero, but it's actually set to 110 watts. Now, 110 watts is important because if you have, um, 110 watts is important because that's the amount of heat a human body will give off on average from the metabolism, okay? So let's say it's midnight, power goes out, alarms go off, colonists get up, and they all march into the greenhouses with a blanket and a pillow, and they all camp out. And the power given off by them will be enough to keep the greenhouse at 72 degrees Fahrenheit. Till the morning, you do repairs. <clears throat> so that's the idea. It's a redundancy, it's a fail-safe mechanism. It reduces power, and you get rid of uh, ESM for uh, trading up the power for, say, reactors or something like that, all around. Okay, if you don't have direct sunlight, you've got a lot of scatter, you've got a tower of one or two. Um, light's coming in, it's not being absorbed by the dust, it's coming in from all directions, omnidirectional. So this panel configuration, uh, where you're going radial with it, allows the most light to go into the thing. Could you put a reflective surface down though so they could bounce, bounce some of the sunlight in to help out if, if they were like reflected on both sides? The sunlight reflecting on them might actually get some reflection That's possible. on side. I was actually thinking the inside of the panels of, that would be facing in might need to be black or dark for just for the absorption and keeping the heat in. But um, yeah, I mean there might be, yeah, there would be, and I my calculation, which I show here, is looking at it geometrically across the greenhouse, the planter boxes that we had there. If you go across here, you're starting at 60% from you know one pi <coughs> radian. To 95 percent, back to six percent, 60 percent. That's an odd function. I don't know how it ended up like that. So yeah, and you know, if you have a reflective surface, that might go. That's a good point. Okay, so that's how the exoskeleton works. But how are you going to believe that the panels will do what they're supposed to do? Because we're pretty advanced. Um, so we're we'll taking you to class, Thermal Insulation 101. You've got, of course, four, princi four principles for, uh, that you have to employ in making the panel. So we should all be versed in conduction, convection, and radiative heat transfer. That's all the physics that uh, generate it. And the only thing to point out here, I've got to go through it pretty fast because I'm running out of time. Um, the constant of thermal conductivity is a uh, property of the matter, material you're using. It's usually not a constant, it's got some temperature dependence to it. Uh, we can ignore convection on Mars and the Mars atmosphere. And by the way, that exoskeleton, I forgot to mention, was sitting in Mars environment. It's outside of that uh, contained greenhouse. And, and then you got a radiation law, which accounts for most of the heat taken off. Uh, you got 295 Kelvin here and 133 Kelvin here. That adds up to a lot of heat. This denominator factor, N plus one, if you have a hot panel, hot plate and cold plate, and then you put N plates in between, you can reduce the heat flow. So that's a trick you do. That's why MLI works. Multiple layers of radiant. And then this final factor here is uh, a variation of conduction. If you have a partial pressure inside a vacuum panel, it's not a total vacuum. Uh, slip flow theory, I'm sorry, I can't say that. <laughs> so I'm gonna refer to it as flip-flop theory. Flip-flop theory says that the conductivity of air that you plug back into this equation is 0.0284 watts per meter K, and it takes into account the power the distance and the gap, the temperature of the gap. And when you look at that, this is kind of an interesting uh, relationship. So here's your pressure going down from 10 Pascal to 
that one is uh, a high vacuum definition. And as you lose more and more molecules, they participate less and less in exchanging heat. And this also captures the temperature effect. Here's outside Mars sky temperature and inside greenhouse temperature. A little bit of a difference. Uh, but you can see when you go from a seven millimeter gap to a one millimeter gap, you pick up an order of magnitude improvement in that thermal connectivity value. And the lower that number is, the better your instrument. So, uh, a couple other things, just the R values, I think you might all be aware of it. We've got a six inch uh, fiberglass batting that goes into the studs of your wall. It's got an R value of 19. The higher the R value, the better insulator. And also, we talk about efficiency, which is R per inch. So that batting would have a R 3 per inch. And that's the way you compare things. Resistor networks, I'm not going to go into this. You just put more insulation on top of each other, the better the insulated properties. You put them in parallel, the worse it gets. It's important for a factor called thermal bridging. So what are the good characteristics of a hyper insulator that goes on that greenhouse? Okay. Of course, it should be an exceptional, exceptional thermal resistance. There's that 110 watts. In order to achieve that with the sky temperature of that, uh, you need an R value. This is SI units. That corresponds to an English unit 1800. That's a pretty high insulator value. You want thin panels in order to keep the light conduct uh, light shadows down on your plants. Uh, material lifetime, 100 years. Let's keep it there for a long time. And please, no plastics or organics inside the panels. They'll degrade in the environment, radiation environment, into a gas and kill our vacuum. Low mass, of course, you want to transport it there. Good mechanical stability, uh, repairability. And the ball peen hammer test. Now, that's where you take a ball peen hammer and you toss it underhand for about four feet and you hit a panel, okay? Vacuum insulated panels you can buy off the shelf have a core that's made out of a uh, porous silicate. And that's kind of brittle stuff and you don't really want that on Mars. Someone's gonna throw it in. With my panels, they've got springs in them. So the only thing you have to worry about is a hammer coming back. So here's the details of my panel. Uh, first time I'm presenting this, by the way. So they're made of all metal. You have two plates. Air pressure outside from Mars. And in between, you hold those plates apart by coil springs made out of uh, 38644 titanium alloy. Uh, the vacuum inside is a high vacuum. You can do that because the panels are all metal and welded shut. There's no valves, and you don't have to put a vacuum pump on them. You might put in a getter metal that keeps the vacuum, that sucks up any air that gets in, it keeps them in that. Springs are in a 21 by 7 array, very tiny wire, 50 mil diameter wire, uh, 5 eighths of an inch diameter spring with 13 and a half coils. And it works out that if you stretch that spring out, it's close to a meter long and it's got a cross-sectional area of about a millionth of a square meter and 38644 has a conductivity of about 5 to 7 watts per meter K. So you end up with a total conduction of 12 microwatts per K for a given spring. So for the entire greenhouse envelope, the springs are conducting at 133 sky temperature only 16 watts out. And inside we got an MLI configuration. And instead of using a blanket, foil, blanket, foil, where the blanket is a uh, polyester or something, I forget what they use. Uh, I just have the foils, 20 copper foils, that have an emissivity of 0 0.009 in the 2 to 8 micron range. Uh, and they're suspended attached to suspended wires that are attached to the outside of the coil springs. I'll show you that in a second. So in all, 
The effective conductivity of that panel is 23 microwatt per meter K, which corresponds to an R value of 3600. So I'm a factor of two better than what I need. But this is theoretical when you get the practical part of it. It'll come down to about 8. And it looks like this. Cross section through the panel from here to here is about 8 tenths of an inch. You've got a formula uh, flat plane of metal up here and up here that seal it in. Here's your spring, 13 and a half coils cut in half. You got some uh, reinforcing U channel running that one meter with seven coils across it. The coils have to be precisely positioned. And then when you run your wires and your foil, they, they attach to the springs at a given rotation angle. And that positioning is important because it, say this point right here on this spring is the same temperature as the next spring, next spring, next spring. So each foil will be at a given temperature that's intermediate somewhere between here. And so you don't have a lateral temperature flow and everything works. Okay. Um, so what if we don't want to use MBIPMs? Uh, here's some common materials. This is from Another graduate paper thesis from uh, MIT in 2013, so it should be pretty current. And this is all building material, and your rigid foam boards, etc. And you get down here, and aero drills are pretty important. They may improve, uh, maybe not. And here's the competition vacuum insulated panels that are at two or maybe three to four milliwatts per meter K. And uh, compare that to MVIPs, which are at 0 0.023 milliwatts per meter K. So um, these are the guys you can't throw a ball in here. Mine you can. So. Uh, there is another potential insulator. Uh, this is a patent from 2007. Alan Feinerman from the University of Illinois professor, Chicago, uh, created this panel. And uh, it's pretty interesting. It's, it's very innovative. You've got a hot plate on this side, cold plate that's cut off. And off each plate, you've got these standoffs here. And on the cold plate, you've got standoffs here. And then he runs a wire horizontally or vertically. And then when you put it under pressure of one ton per square foot, like you have in the Earth's atmosphere, those wires cross, and the tension force, the wire capability, holds up that one ton per square foot. And it's real fine wire, so you have a little kind of fix for that. But the problem are the uh, <coughs> MLIs that he's got jury-rigged in there. He's only got four or five, probably more four from ours. And then communicating with so, other uses, I don't know, I'll leave it up to you guys to figure it out. Living quarters, uh, above Earth, you've got radiation issues. Maybe if you open up the caverns down below, you could put it across the entrance. Or insulate working living areas underneath ground. And thermal storage is a potential. You can build a building with the fixed panels put a bunch of Martian rocks in it, lay down a whole extra amount of solar panels, use the heat to heat up the rocks to 350 degrees, because they're metal panels. And then at night, when you don't have a solar, you can <coughs> run air through it, recycle it through a heat pump, and that'll convert to electricity. And you don't have to haul rechargeable batteries. Okay, so what next? Confirm usefulness. I'll talk to folks here, find out what you all think. Uh, Googlets, the numbers that she has in there are kind of old. I think there's an update that uh, improved on some of them. Some of them. Uh, the SMs like to compare the MIG versus nuclear power. And then finally, uh, it's important to identify a resource to develop the MBIPs. I don't think I mentioned I'm retired. <laughs> I spent all my money on the uh, patent rights. The patent apparently was 
first filed in 96 and it's no longer valid. So there's not a lot of intellectual property there. Uh, so, you know, I can help out, but if I could find someone that give me a hand, it would be nice. So the sequence of things that you want to do, complete the earth-based design, get someone else besides Ken T. still to do it. Uh, build and validate the earth-based panels. If all is as advertised, and you design uh, a Mars panel, update the ESMs, make sure it makes sense to go there. Uh, build an initial Mars panel and maybe stick it in JPL's chamber and do some measurements on it. And finally, let's go to Mars with it. So, I always like to leave people with a few words. So like Asimov's quote, still valid now as it was in 71, and actually researched it. Okay, I looked in Wikipedia, and there are 898, at least 898 technical institutes around the world versus four that are dedicated to wisdom. Five. <laughs> so I guess you go with the money. So MBIP, don't leave Earth without it. And with that, any questions? All right. <clears throat> We're growing plants there. And the growing season would be three months to mature a vegetable. What is the effect of GCRs in that period? Effect of what? Galactic cosmic rays. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, my health is too, and I should know that. Uh, in general, plants have much higher ability to s sustain radiation damage, and their life cycle is shorter. Yeah. You have to worry about the seeds. Seeds you can maybe find a way to insulate on the way out to Mars. It's easier to transport the seeds than it is to take yeah. one and a half tons yeah. of food. So you have to protect the seed, right? But the growing season. During the growing season, if it's short enough, the accumulated dose is low enough that it doesn't damage the plant. Okay. That's that's what they get into. Sure. Another idea would be to run curtains on the inside of the greenhouse. I'm assuming they're less sufficient. But mm -hmm. is that something that would be an alternative to saying a good portion of the heat loss? Uh, curtains on the inside, yeah, like MLI blankets yeah. like on the inside. Uh, the insulation is there. It won't have the fail-safe capability. You won't be able to get down to that 110 watts. Uh, so you'll always have potential for uh, loss of plant life, loss of human life if you lose power. And that's that's what I kind of got out of it. It doesn't have the louvers that you have on your Well, I mean, you, you could put up an insulation blanket, but the insulation properties is, uh, of any other material, are the R values per inch is like 50. I'm doing about 4,000. And so, yeah, you could, but it doesn't get you where you really need to do. And it's, uh, and, and I actually can't use my panels on the inside either because it's a higher pressure. Higher pressure squeezes more. I need stronger springs that have bigger diameters and I lose the effect. When I, uh, the springs for earth are three, you know, 300 mils in diameter for white and massive four turns. And I can only get about an R value of uh, 134 for a two inch. And this is I presume it's okay to build these panels even under the Earth's atmosphere. They'll be compressed, but then as they get into the Martian atmosphere, well, they can't compress because you have springs there. Yeah. So you can you can have them sitting unvacuumed, let's say. But you really want to transport them. They're more compact to transport. Just the springs, just the roll of, uh, of foil, and then assemble them on site. Now another idea is to assemble them on the way. You've got six months to do nothing. <laughs> Get a couple of guys building them in another separate chamber and figure out a way to land them on the planet. Thank you. Thank you.